The sun is not as stable as people believe. It's not this Aristotelian perfect thing in the sky. And I believe that a massive solar event, a solar outburst, um, is what ended the last ice age, and as I'll come to, also began the Younger Dryas. So the sun, what's the primary elements in the sun? Helium, but even more so hydrogen, right? Hydrogen at high temperatures, et cetera, it can be dissociated. You know, hydrogen's proton with electron around it. It can be dissociated just into a positive proton, just a negative electron. They can be ejected off, move at fast speeds. You've got the solar wind, et cetera. A general name for that is plasma. So when I'm talking plasma, that's what I'm talking about, not blood plasma. It's actually named after blood plasma because it sort of acts like it's um, plasma physicists will tell you, it acts like it's alive. There may be some truth to that in the sense of, um, you know, consciousness of the plasma, et cetera. I mean, but that's another metaphysical thing we can talk about later. But that's why I'm talking about plasma. Think of primarily protons, electrons moving at intense speeds, sometimes subluminal, very close, you know, good percentage of the speed of light. You can have major plasma outbursts from the sun. We call them things like coronal mass ejections or micronovas when it throws out material and all all directions. You can have major solar flares. You can have uh, what are known as proton events or uh, SPE, solar proton or solar particle events. Um, and these things happen. We know they happen. There was a major one in 1859 known as the Carrington event, named after Richard Carrington, the astronomer who was um, studying the sun uh, and first saw the, major, the initial flare coming off the Carrington event. Um, green line ice core data picks this up, uh, sediment core data, and it all indicates that there was a major uh, events of the sun and a major warming again at 9700 BCE. So th you can think of pretty sort of plasma and um, the solar wind coming in, it hits the atmosphere and forms things like the auroras, the aurora borealis, auroras astralis. Did anyone see that we had some so severe solar activity recently. I say severe from a human perspective, nothing from an astrophysical perspective, you know, of what the sun really could do. Um, and you see these. And so this is just a NASA diagram showing the energetic particles coming in. Can you see the little Earth there? Of course, this is not to scale. The Earth is much further away, much smaller if it were to scale. Um, Someone who first talked about what I'm talking about is the astrophysicist Thomas Gold, who's unfortunately now deceased, and he was a brilliant uh, prize-winning astrophysicist, but he suggested that the sun could undergo major disruptions, major solar outbursts. And he suggested this back in the early 1960s. So this is a quote from one of his papers. He said, in the case of a, quote, big solar outburst, the Earth's magnetic field could clearly not hold up the incoming gas. That's what he called plasma. They called it gas back then. Um, plasma, the charged particles, and it would indeed drive down to the atmospheric level, and he said it would take the form of a series of sparks burning for extended periods of time and carrying currents of hundreds of millions of amperes. And he talked how, about how it would cause massive destruction on the surface of the Earth. So think of like huge lightning bolts hitting in certain areas, even as people are seeing auroras and disruptions all over the place. And one thing he suggested is that you look for vitrification. What is vitrification? It's when you have really intense heat. I mean, in some cases, you're talking tens of thousands of degrees Celsius hitting the surface of a rock. It melts it, or a flash melts it, and then it recongeals and forms a glass, a natural glass. Um, and he actually started looking for this. Vitrification is hard to find on Earth. At best, you're going to find, like, in many cases, little spirules or little fragments, but it weathers away very quickly, erodes away very quickly. But what's, what do we have, fortunately, attached to the Earth, going around the Earth? Come on. The moon. And 
Thomas Gold actually looked at lunar samples and lunar data, and he published as far back as 1969, based on the early Apollo missions to the moon, that he found what he called some glazing, vitrification, that is, is apparently due to radiation heating. It suggests a giant solar outburst, I'm quoting him, in geologically recent times. Geologically recent times being translated into our language, end of the last ice age. And so there's photographs of it um, because it's preserved on the moon and he could find it because, you know, you don't have the same weathering conditions. But if you look closely, and other people have now been looking closely, you can find vitrification on Earth. Some of this may go back to earlier periods of solar activity. So, for instance, in Liz Libyan desert glass, the Libyan desert glass, which is actually in Egypt, it's in the Libyan desert in Egypt. This is a picture from the, uh, I took, or either I or Katie took it in the Geological Museum in Cairo, but for 25 hundred square kilometers, you have this strewn field of this glass. Um, or in the uh, western desert, you have another strewn field of 400 square kilometers of uh, Dockley glass. This, do you see how it's glass? It's very crude. It sort of looks like um, uh, cinder or scoria or slag. Um, but that's what it is. Melted and recongealed. This is very classic bubbly. Well, there's people... Geologically, they've usually just, dis not dismissed it, but so it must be a comet or a meteor or something, but there's no evidence of that. And when you have these huge fields of it, that's much more parsimonious, I would say, much more economical to say, no, this is from a solar outburst and hitting and melting. Uh, you don't have craters associated with it, et cetera. Um, and there's been now analysis of fulgurites. You know what fulgurite is? It's where lightning hits the rock uh, or hits sand or hits soil, and it melts it, it recongeals, it makes um, these mineral uh, composites that are known as fulgurites. So you can literally, people literally chase lightning to see where it hit and then get the samples. And when they've done this, this is a work by Michael Joseph um, in particular in this case, he and I'll, I'll sort of summarize his quote there, he's pointed out that what you find in fulgurites is also what you find in a lot of these glasses, natural glasses that have been found that people have suggested are meteorites or asteroid or cometary genesis, but no, you get them from lightning strikes also. So this is why I'm saying that a lot of this data that's being used to support a comet hypothesis is also compatible with a solar outburst. Um, or, for instance, uh, shock lamellae in uh, rocks and um, associated types of features. It's now been demonstrated that in experimentally in the lab and also in the field where you chase lightning, major lightning, et cetera, that this can come from lightning. Um, a generation of shock lamellae and melting rocks by lightning induced shock waves and electrical heating. You don't need comets um, the, and the like to get some of this data. Am I making sense? Yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, again, and vitrification on Earth, I've tried to look at this uh, myself in many places. So the mode of mark, um, which is sort of a, what they call a dark age fort, uh, you have vitrification there. Here I am in Scotland, and there I'm holding in my hands. Can you see the bubbling and vitrification? This is the mode of mark. It's usually considered dark age, uh, time of uh, King Arthur. You've heard of King Arthur and some of the legends that they lived in glass castles. This is the glass castle. No, literally, they knew what they were talking about. This is glass, but they weren't building these. It turns out these go back to essentially the end of the last ice age or so. They've, that's been shown archaeologically. They're very old. They were reused in the Dark Ages, like 500, 600 AD. Am I making sense? Um, uh, so you have that. On the Giza Plateau, we have the Sphinx. Remember the Sphinx? There is evidence that the Sphinx was hit by lightning itself. Um, we have at the Temple of Isis in the shadow of the Great Pyramid, 
this stella was found. It's sometimes known as the inventory stella, and it literally says it's an ancient stella, but not that ancient. What I mean by that is most people say, oh, it's maybe uh, 600, 500 B.C., somewhere in that range, B.C., you know, 1,200, uh, no, 2,500 years old or somewhere like that. But what it purports to be is a copy of a much earlier, earlier, earlier description. And what it says is that Khufu, who supposedly who supposedly built the Great Sphinx, that Khufu actually, um, that Khufu actually was there, and I'm sorry, Khufu, who uh, supposedly had the Great Pyramid built, was actually there and looking at the Sphinx and looking at a thunderbolt because the Sphinx had been hit by lightning. Am I making sense? You follow what I say? So this is from a quote from Salim Hassan, one of the great um, uh, classic 20th century Egyptologists. And he said, if we could believe its inscription, we should have to credit Khufu with having repaired the Sphinx. Now, Khufu supposedly was the pharaoh, as I said, who built or had built the great pyramid, which was supposedly older than the Sphinx. So how could he be repairing something that wasn't even built at the time? Um, uh, having repaired the Sphinx, apparently after it had been damaged by a thunderbolt. Um, and uh, Hassan goes on to say, as a matter of fact, there may be a grain of truth in this story, for the tail of the Nemi's headdress is certainly missing. There is actually to be seen on the back of the Sphinx a scar of the breakage. Therefore, it is perhaps likely that the Sphinx was struck by lightning, but there is not a particle of evidence to show that this accident happened in the reign of Khufu. And if you look at the actual inscription, I don't think it happened in the reign of Khufu. He was looking at ancient evidence much earlier than him. So he's already, according to this inscription, the Sphinx is there. It had been hit by um, a thunderbolt, well, lightning, plasma strike. Everyone with me? And I think he was repairing it. As we know, the Sphinx was repaired. There it goes. And we now have evidence, I'm convinced, of actual vitrification on the Giza Plateau. This is some of it. I'm sitting there by it. And this is uh, on the top on the left side, there you see me with some of it. On the right side, you see me with some. It's sort of uh, under me. That's the mortuary, so-called mortuary temple of the second pyramid. And, oop, went too fast. Uh, there we go. And we have uh, not only scoria, but we also have, if you know what they are, Lichtenberg um, uh, patterns under the pyramids. They seem to spread out from under the pyramid. When lightning or electrical discharge hits certain substances, you've probably all seen it. It makes like a dendritic pattern or, or a fractal pattern going out. Or uh, That's what we, do you see that there? That's what we, I'm convinced, have now. And it looks like this plateau was hit by major, major lightning strikes, but I don't believe atmospheric lightning, I think, from a solar outburst. This may be why it's a sacred site. The Sphinx was possibly already there, was hit by it, but this made the whole site even more sacred. They built the pyramids on top of it. I'm convinced that there's probably older structures under the pyramids, but that's another story. Um, and I want to point out, I've got a little note to remind myself that there's other places where you get the same pattern of a major lightning strike in very ancient times and then monuments built on top of it, ancient structures. One is at Kalanish, or also known as Kalane in Scotland, where you have a megalithic um, structure built on what geophysically we now understand to have been a place where a major plasma or major lightning strike hit. So a lot of evidence to put that all together. So aside from all the isotope data, the moon data, the lunar data, the ancient vitrification, um, we also have petroglyphs as part of the archaeological record, which I think undoubtedly points to solar events and not impactor events, if I, I could use that term. Although one could argue that maybe impactor and solar events could be 
occurring somewhat simultaneously. Uh, why are the lights going off? <laughs> Um, so anyway, we have microspheres, like I said, biomass, um, black mats, all of that is compatible with a solar event, and plasma discharges heating the surface can also cause craters. I want to point that out. We know that both from uh, laboratory data and from actual physical uh, uh, natural phenomena. So I don't know if you realize that even small um, well, not that small, but atmospheric lightning strikes. Can they cause craters? Absolutely. This has been demonstrated. I mean, it's been observed um, in cases where a huge lightning bolt hits, say, a parking lot, and then there's a big crater there, et cetera. And again, the atmospheric lightning bolt like that is nothing compared to what we're talking about in geologic time.